Well, folks, we are at war with a devious mind, an all-seeing eye, manipulating the world around us. And many claim that such a thing doesn't exist. Yet we are witnessing the absolute destruction of all that is decent and good. So what can we do about it? Well, folks, the work of a devious unseen eye is recorded in Alice Bailey's Externalization of the Hierarchy on page 39 in the PDF. It is interesting to note that only through human beings that these three centers ever come into true functioning activity, and likewise that the three major ideologies, totalitarian, the democratic, means socialist here, and the communistic may be the response, distorted yet responsive to the forces playing from two higher centers onto the human this we discussed earlier in The Destiny of the Nations, page 22. Those of you who are seeking to serve humanity and join the hierarchical effort to bring healing to the world pain must learn to penetrate behind appearances, behind the methods and schemes, the results and the effects on the physical plane, and endeavor to contact the forces of the Shambhala or the hierarchy. Plus the human need which has produced these mods of expressions, thus seeing them for what they are, not worn out systems and childish efforts, at improvements, but new embryonic plans eventually to come to release and the culture and civilization of the new age. Isn't that interesting? She calls that these totalitarian, democratic, socialist, and communist are expressions, childish efforts at improvement, and they are in the embryonic stages. They can be used by the hierarchy to produce a perfect world. So, what does he say? Well, let me explain, because I'm going to go to page 39, uh, to, near to the end of the book of Externalization of the Hierarchy. She mentions the need to destroy totalitarianism of 1939-1945 Nazi Germany. Now, if the hierarchy watchers like to use this flawed system, why do they seek to destroy it? Well, they want to use it as an embryonic function to, and use the, what they learn from it to create their perfect world, okay? The answer is discovered in this. They play both sides. One is called the dark uh, side, or the dark bad guy lodge, or the dark lodge they call it, and the other is the white, the good guy lodge. This is, in, this is the order out of chaos principle from mystical Gnosticism in order to create a brave new world of pure spirit. You got to use chaos to reach a state of synthesis that leads eventually to make a better world, free of pain, all the loving and all that stuff. So let's review this dark side, bad guy side lodge here, folks. And then let me go back here and look at this. Here on externalization of the hierarchy, page 40, the two forces used to increase tension in the world, the forces of materialism streaming out of the three worlds from the so-called dark forces or black lodge. And from those group of lives and workers, which are the antithesis of the Great White Lodge. There is little that I can tell you about the dark forces. They are not the problems of humanity, but that of the hierarchy, what she's talking about. So I'm going to go back and kind of show you again a brief review so you know, know what I'm, where I'm going with this. This is what they do. This is why she says over in this other part here that... In here, the, the totalitarian, the democratic socials, and communistic are flawed. These uh, uh, are, are not worn out systems at the bottom paragraph. They are embryonic plans to eventually reach the civilization of a new age. How so? So let's look at the three-pillared system. Let's look at this, the white lodge, dark lodge thing. Let's look at it. Here we have the pillar of severity, justice, it's the feminine side. It is the dark side. You have the pillar of mercy, compassion, the masculine, the white lodge, the good guys. So you have the good guys pit against the bad guys in order to create synthesis. The synthesis is called the crown, the pillar, the eye. When the, the result of it is, is to merge into equally, equilibrium or bring balance and harmony, a synthesis back into play. So let's continue to look at this. So you have the severity of justice, the dark lodge, the pillar of mercy, 
uh, creating tension and chaos in the world in order to merge everybody into the central pillar of synthesis. This is the same concept seen, seen in Hegel's dialectic of thesis, antithesis, to reach a synthesis, a balance, by blending the severity of justice fused together with mercy, compassion, by illumination to create the process of constant compromise to make a brave new world. The idea here is to destroy the old world and its materialistic system, bring it into synthesis to create a pure spirit world of balance, harmony. So you have the flawed systems of Marxism, the flawed systems of social democrats, societies. You have the flawed system of totalitarianism or fascism, but they are the embryonic stages to bring about synthesis. So the dark pillar is basically this, folks. This is the dark pillar. The dark pillar are described in one particular way as the enemy. And then you have the White Lodge is described as the good guys who are going to fix everything and reach synthesis through compromise. That's basically what we're talking about here. So the three forms of totalitarian fascism each uses uh, corporate financial systems to impose values on their citizens. In other words, the state will tell the corporations and the businesses what to produce to for what is known as the struggle. The struggle or the war to get back to this mystical uh, world of pure spirit, a new world. Okay, and that's why Alice Bailey identified. Why she channeled this at embryonic stages to re reach perfection. This is what the hierarchy likes to work with. Totalitarian systems, dark side. There's three types of fascism. You have the not Nazi type. And then you have the Italian and Spanish fascist systems. They're also expansionistic and in using industry and banking to maintain control over their population to teach them right human relations and obedience to the state. And so, so this, all this would be based on socialism and collectivism. And war against those who oppose that form of government and to eradicate those because you want a socialist model. You want, you know, you want to make the trains run on time. You want to fix the roads. You want to do this. You can't have any democracies, any free speech because that's just hindrance of all this. So they want to educate the people to embrace a, the Gnostic utopic version of utopia. However, Italy, fascist Italy, strayed away from this by invading Ethiopia to restore the Roman Empire, and he ended up siding with Hitler. So he became the Dark Lodge type. He became the Dark Lodge face of fascism. Okay? And then you have the Spanish. Many people just discount the Spanish thing, but there was a Spanish Civil War in 1936, and, and fascism I, died out when... Uh, General Franco died. I can't remember what year he died. I think in the 1970s, and it turned into the nation now. But it was a fascist-controlled nation for many years. And basically, that type of fascism is what the hierarchy likes because it went to an embryonic stage of trying to take over everything, which they want to do, but they want to make it more peaceful, more acceptable, and more of a white lodge type of thing to save the world. So all forms of totalitarian fascism is um, in, discovered or, ex, or basically uh, explained by the use of struggle to one day reach their version of a Plato's Republic ruled by ruling oligarchy and state working together. Okay, render uh, basically reordering society and culture to reflect new values, new, new morals that are approved by the state in order to achieve perfection of a perfect, well-ordered society, a paradise on earth of social collectivism. So you have industry, banking, educational, media systems were used to teach right human relations. The state would dictate to the industry what could be sold and purchased in the struggle against the old norms. It was actually uh, a struggle against Christianity, Judaic Christian principles, and Western civilization. In other words, the house break their citizens to surrender their humanity to be able to live successfully in the collective hive. Revelations chapter 13 talks about this in a biblical way. It speaks of a time like this where no one can buy, sell, or eat unless they have the mark of allegiance with the beast system. So let's look at these slides here. Externalization of the hierarchy talks about using the dark forces here. The task of the forces, the White Lodge and the Dark Lodge, is the preservation of the form of life and the working out of the methods and aims which are inherent in the process of manifestation. The Black Lodge, so-called because it's occupied with the form aspect manifestation of the 
the white lodge that with the conscious aspect might therefore be stated that the the forces of darkness are powerful energies working to preserve that which is ancient and material. Thus, they are preeminently the forces of crystallization, a, of form, preservation, attractiveness of matter, and of the lure of that which ex is existent in the form of life in three worlds. Let's go on to the next page here. It continues. They work to prevent the understanding of that which is of the new age. They endeavor to preserve that which is familiar and old, to contract the effects of the oncoming culture and civilization to bring blindness to the people and to feed steadily the existing fires of hate, separateness, and criticism and cruelty. These forces, as far as intelligent peoples of the world are concerned, work insidiously and cloak their effort in fair words, leading even disciples to, to express hatred of persons' ideologies, fostering the hidden seeds of hatred found in many human beings. So, what is she saying here? She's saying that, you know, the uh, the idea of the dark lodge of the the, the the fascist like German fascism of the 30s and the mid 1940s here is based upon hate and, and, and cruelty okay that's what it is so so this is explains why the hierarchy through the black hat wearing lodge the bad guys uses Nazi type fascism and Stalinism because they believe that Stalinism is a perversion of true communism to maintain the struggle against traditional norms and values. Um, God's order and design. So the white hat good guy lodge types emerge to bring order out of, out of the controlled chaos because they're controlling the, the dark side and they're controlling the white side and they're creating the chaos to bring you know, order out of chaos. They want to bring about this new age of a pure spirit to reach that to a real pure spirit state. So the totalitarian, hardcore fascist, uh, that's what they were against. So all throughout her book, she talks about the hardcore fascist and Stalinist periods. You know, they want to get back to this embryonic stage and get out of that mode and get into the white hat side because they want to bring synthesis and bring these two sides together get rid of all that's bad and good so you send the black hat lodge in there to stir up trouble stir up riots in the street stir up all controversy in order to bring down the system okay they're playing both sides so what they do is they will use the german fascist okay model and italian fascist model and stalinist model as the Dark Lodge, as the means to label any who oppose the White Hat Good Guy Lodge goal of a new world government uh, of a utopia as the enemy. Because they will say that if you oppose us, you're the bigot, you're the Nazi, you're the fascist, you're the enemy of all people and progress. So everybody can relate that to that, that, that the, the 1930 uh, Germany, 1945 journey, Germany was, you know, that, that era of World War II was bad. And they can look at history and see that Stalin was bad. You don't want that. And, if, and so if you are conservative, if you are a Christian, you are one of those people. In their worldview, communism was corrupted by Stalinism's dark lodge, bad guy. So Alice Bailey prefers a purified version of communism guided by the white hat wearing lodge, which allows for the hierarchy to impart a new religion to help solidify a new world collective mindset to enforce right human relations to stop all the pain and suffering of the world that the hierarchy uses the dark lodge people to do. So let's, this is brought out here, and this says, she says so right here. In Externalization of the Hierarchy, page 372, she sums up all this struggle here. And she, sides with a, she actually is siding with a kinder, gentler version of communism. And she says, and I quote, The material goal which all who love their fellow men and serve the hierarchy must ever have in mind and at heart is the defeat of totalitarianism. What she's saying here, folks, is bad severity type of totalitarianism so if you disagree with this person and this ideology you are labeled unjustly labeled as a totalitarian 
because they can go in history and say, no, 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 look, you, you are a racist, you are a bigot, you, you, blah, 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 down the line. And we have to destroy you, you have to cancel you, we're justified because we're the good guys, we want to create a brave new world. We're justified to get rid of you, ha, 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 ha. That is basically what it's about. Let's keep continuing here. And she goes in the next paragraph, I do not say the defeat of communism, but the defeat of that evil process which involves the imposition of ideas which can be the method of democratic nations and the churches everywhere, just as much as, as it is the method of the USSR. She's referring to Stalinism. She doesn't want to defeat communism. She wants a kinder, gentler version of communism. She wants a kinder, gentle version of fat totalitarianism. She wants a kinder, gentler version of, of social dem dem democracies, all gelled into one loving, embracing community. <sighs> Everybody go, hum. So let's continue. So, click the third paragraph. This we call totalitarianism. I would ask you to have this distinction clearly in your mind. Your material goal is to defeat uh, all that infringes human free will and keeps humanity in ignorance, and it applies equally to any established system, Catholic or Protestant, which imposes its concepts and its will upon its inherent adherence. So right there she is saying what the left is saying right now. You're a Christian. You're a Protestant. You're Catholic. You are the enemy. You are totalitarian. You are a fascist. You you are a fascist. So we have to have Antifa, anti-fascists to go after you. So you have to have real fascists, brown shirt, black shirt fascists to defeat fascism. It's, it's it, it, They live in a world of their mind and make believe deceived by the universe lie. That's what, I can't explain it any better than that. So you have recorded in here a direct connection of historicism or occult connection with what we're seeing today. You have the plan laid out. Many people are not paying attention to this at all because they don't, they, no one in the church is really exposing this because it's hard to go through this stuff. I mean, God really has to call you because there's a spirit behind these works I'm saying. I don't advise, I do not advise anybody to read <laughs> Alice Bailey verbatim. If you feel led to, you got to use a PDF, do a word search, type in government, type in media, type, not, not media, but uh, radio, TV, type in uh, uh, financial systems or whatever in there, and you'll, 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 you'll get dominionist theology right there. Um, you talk, type in word of power in some of these books, you might have to go through several, and you'll get, you know, um, more than you bargained for and what you want to know. And you'll find all kinds of things. So when I did this, I started total researching communism, totalitarianism, and what she meant by democratic, which she means democratic socialism. Um, this is where I found this. And then I put it together when I read it. You know, I got to plead the blood of Jesus, cleanse myself. But, you know, God gave me permission to. But I don't suggest, <laughs> I try to tell you to warn you about this. This is this stuff is, is something else, okay? But she's talking about the dark hat, um, severity lodge here, the pillar of severity, uh, the dark side versus the white good guy side, and to create a synthesis under the all-seeing eye. That's what she's trying to do. So let's continue reading this. Totalitarianism is the basis of evil today. It is found in all systems of government. Education is found in the home and the community. I refer not here to the laws which make group relations sound, possible, and right. Such laws are essential to community and national well-being and are not totalitarian in nature. In that one sentence that I have highlighted there in italicized, she's referring to fascism used with right motives. She's so referring to communism and social dem democratic system used with right motives. What are right motives here? Uh, anything that is materialistic and they brand it, they label it, the what Catholic Protestant that imposes concepts on its will upon its inheritance is, is, is totalitarianism. It's fascist. It's German fascism that she spent a lot of time in externalization of the hierarchy talking about defeating. This is what confuses people because they don't understand order out of chaos, white lodge, dark lodge, pitting against each other, playing both sides. That's why a lot of these people can say never let a good crisis go to waste because they created the crisis in order to solve it, to create synthesis. Let's go back here and look at this further. I refer, in the last paragraph, I refer to the imposition of the will of a few upon the total mass of the people. The defeat 
of this undesirable tendency everywhere as your definite material goal. She, right now, she's speaking about the, the German Nazis here and labeling true Christianity, conservatism as being the same stripes as Nazis and Stalinists who want to control everybody who are, that we're witnessing today. We're witnessing it with cancel culture. We're witnessing it in all types of ways. So, where therefore, she defines totalitarianism as the modern left defines it. If anyone is conservative, a free thinker, has common sense, a live and let live world attitude, you know, a worldview of grace and mercy of the Christian or Judaic Christian traditions, libertarians, all who love their country, want the best for their country, who love their children, believe that they have the right to govern their own children, who believe in traditional family, and all who are decent and moral people are painted as the same stripe of Adolf Hitler, the SS, and the Gestapo. Satanists do that toward Christians all the time. They're out to control you. They're out to take over the world. You know, and so we have to be the good guys. We have to stop this. You know, you own nothing and you will be happy about it when we control everything. And then you will be happy in your 15 minute ghetto, your city. Okay, that is exactly what she's talking about, folks, in that paragraph. So you pit two sides together. Let's look at this slide here. So, what I'm trying to say, if you look on the screen here, it says the pillar of severity and justice is a feminine, the dark lodge. It's um, extreme totalitarianism, inflexible fascism, Stalinism, materialism, and individualism in, in the most pure, raw, selfish state, okay? Then the, the good hat guys are the pillar of mercy and compassion, the White Lodge, are the kinder, gentler totalitarian fascist, communism, and collectivist. This, I want to ask you, that, <laughs> that sounds like contradiction in terms? No, this is a well-established plan to bring order out of chaos. Every cult uses this, every political cult, every totalitarian. Since I would go back to Genesis chapter 6 period, I go back to days of Nimrod as well, use this system. Nebuchadnezzar used this system. This, is, this system is old as the hills. You create the chaos in order to control your population and gain control of over everything. You need a ruling oligarchy who makes the money to do it. And you can use and tell the oligarchy, uh, let's, let's, we, we can profit big on this, so let's work together, you know. Who cares if they sell out their country to China? Who cares? We're in the noble good. We're, we're on a, a goal of getting rid of materialism and evil in the world. We are the good guys. We're going to reorder communism to make it loving, kind, and perfect. Woohoo! We will we, we'll allow even the religion, because communism is a religion, a, a secular religion. And we'll put, impose a new world religion for all the religious minded people. Noah Harari is talking about rewriting the Bible with the AI and creating a perfect religion in order to control people. This is how the fascists totalitarians really think there's really no difference between the two don't be fooled because what they're trying to do is destroy the world to bring about the central pillar the crown of the eye to merge into a synthesis and i wrote it down here this is tavata the one of the three virtuous ways of achieving purity equilibrium through a paralaic and paralaic means dissolving melting away termination bringing into a non-existent state by blending masculine Feminine together to create a synthesis of unity, harmony, balance, a state, a nirvana, a pure spirit. Okay, that is the goal of the all-seeing eye, of this central pillar, to get everybody under the Luciferian logic system. Getting that's what exactly what it is. So we uh, see this explained further in these next two slides. So I'm just going to go to these next two slides. Alice Bailey, The Unfinished Autobiography, 1951, Chapter 6. The thing we have to develop in the world today is the world citizen, think global citizen, folks, is the global citizen and bring an end to this crude nationalism which has been the source of so much hate. So if you love your country, you're, even though you were founded on liberty and freedom and free speech, that has to die because that's evil. If you want the best for your country, you're labeled as a, a Nazi. 
in the reappearance of Christ, Luce's publishing in 1948, page 188, 189, she, and I quote, this inherent fanaticism found in every reactionary group will fight against the appearance of the coming world religion and the spread of esorteicism. And by esorteicism, she means uh, uh, do as thou will and a unity and collectivism. For this struggle, certain of the well-organized churches, through their conservative elements, their most powerful elements, are already grinding themselves. So folks, what she's talking about here. Is, is simply this. If you're a reactionary force of a Judaic Christian con, conservative tradition, or if you are, 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 you don't believe in this and you're an atheist and you believe in free speech and liberty and you're a libertarian, or you're just a good old boy, good old girl who loves their country, you, you have to go. You are old fashioned. You're a materialist. We have to destroy the material world. We're getting to a spirit world. We have to bring synthesis together. The synthesis comes in the seventh root race stage. I don't have time to go back and do that. About the middle of the root, seventh root race stage, you enter into a world of new spirit. And at the end, uh, when at the very beginning of the sixth root race era stage, recalls for the um, H. P. Blavatsky wrote about is the destruction of the United States and Western Europe. She wrote that in the 1870s. How did she know? She channeled demons. What can I say? <laughs> um, and so calling for that. So that's why we saw in 2014 and 15 you know, people and movie stars with their, that whatever that was, a one eye, the Saturn's eye commercials going on and the commercials you saw with the cubes and all the stuff was the age of Saturn uh, issuing in in initiating into the age of Aquarius, the seventh, the sixth root race stage, just before we reach Paralaic, the destruction of the material world to get everybody gelled into pure spirit. These people are insane. They're on a religious crusade. This is a Gnostic um, version of political. This is a political Gnosticism in order to achieve this. That's what the pillar system is about, to bring this synthesis about. Let's continue here. I'm going to go right through here. Alice Bailey offered a solution to this, and she continues, and I quote, If we can delay the crystallization of the ancient evils which produced the world war and arrest the reactionary forces in every nation, will we shall be making way for that which is new and opening the door to the activities of new group of world servers in every land, that group which is the agent of Christ. She's talking about the agent of Antichrist. You will enter the Messiah into this new spirit world. Let's look at this again. Let's look at it again. We must arrest the re reactionary forces of every nation. We shall be making way for that which is new and opening the door. So, so why you're seeing all this junk happening in, in the world, folks, is simply this. They're on a religious crusade. And so if you're a conservative Christian, you believe in traditional values, you are a reactionary person who needs to be re-educated, converted, or eradicated. In their world, they have to eradicate you. They have to silence you. They have to cancel you. They'll close your bank account. They'll do anything because they're on the, on the side of right. They're the good guys. They're why they're, they are enlightened. They know by the all-seeing eye. They are enlightened. They are enlightened to create a brave new perfect world, and you are just getting in the way. And what does it matter? Like I think Lenin or no or Stalin. Or Stalin said, "You got to crack a few eggs to get there." That's amazing, isn't it? So let's look at this next slide. In Alice Bailey, Externalization of the Hierarchy, page 39, it's interesting to note that, that it is only through human beings that these three major centers ever come into true functioning activity. And likewise, the three major ideologies, the totalitarian, the democratic, I mean socialist, and communistic may be the response. Distorted yet responsive to the forces playing from the two higher centers on the human. Okay? The two centers on the, you know, look at this. The dark and the light. The dark pillar, white pillar. Thesis, antithesis. Okay, that's basically what, what you're talking about here. Go back in history. Create a template that people can relate to and label your enemies, at, you know, good, decent human beings, as the enemy, as those people that you created and caused. So you label them as Nazis, bigots, homophobes, so forth, etc., but down the line, so you can go after them. That is exactly what Alice Bailey is saying. 
Okay, she really is. And she writes here, the human need which has produced these modes of expressions and thus see them for what they are. Not worn out systems and childish efforts at improvement, but embryonic plans whereby eventually may come release the culture of the new age. Isn't that nice? Isn't that really nice? How do you like that? The Apostle Paul is correct in this. In Ephesians chapter 6, where he says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rules of darkness, and hosts of weakness in heavenly places. Uh, these are the hierarchy. They're the ones playing both sides. The principalities, powers, rules of darkness, who are being used to implement the plans of a devious mind called the all-seeing eye, because the all-seeing mind is the universal mind. The all-seeing eye is the universal mind. Say it again. The all-seeing eye is the universal mind. Who alters the meanings of... Uh, uh, of, of reality in order to achieve this where good has to be called evil in order to take over and evil must be extolled as the greatest good and that's exactly what it means to bring synthesis the bible even mentions in the last days they'll be called evil good and good evil we're seeing that world so that system involves uh altering even the meaning of words like love service and helping the downtrodden in ways none of us would ever mean. Let's look at uh, this next slide, which explains the plan and why for the struggle. It's a war against God and his people, decent people. And look at these slides. Page 372 of the Externalization of Hierarchy, I quote, Your spiritual goal is establishing of the kingdom of God. One of the first steps toward this is to prepare minds men to accept the fact that the reappearance of the Antichrist or the, the Christ is imminent. You must tell men everywhere that the masters and their groups of disciples are actively working to bring order out of chaos. Can I just say, I told you so <laughs> right now? <laughs> Let's continue. Third paragraph. You must tell them that there is a plan and that nothing can possibly arrest the working out of that plan. You must tell them that the hierarchy stands and that it is, has stood for thousands of years and it is an expression of accumulated wisdom of the ages. You must tell them above all, above all else that God is love. The hierarchy is love and that Christ is coming because he loves humanity. Now look at the next slide in page 39. In the first solar system, in the center which is humanity is prepared, and the principles of intelligence came into manifestation, the second solar system, the hierarchy of love, made its appearance, and must come into full manifestation, thereby enabling the love of God to be seen. In our next solar system, our, our solar age, you're talking about an age, the center which we call Shambhala, will manifest itself, the will aspect of deity, intelligently, through love. It is interesting to note that only through human beings that these three centers ever come into true functioning activity, and likewise the three major ideologies, the totalitarian, the democratic, the communist, may be the response distorted, yet responsive to the forces playing from the two higher centers. Wow, I'm reading this in context now, folks. And let's see if I can go back to this slide here. The human need which has produced these mods of expression and is seeing them for what they are, not worn out systems and childish efforts at improvement, but embryonic plans, thereby eventually all may come to release the culture of a civilization, a new age. You want to express the will aspect of deity through love. The three major ideologies, the totalitarian, the social democratic, communist, maybe the response, these are embryonic stages, folks. It's all about love. Love, 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 love. They're altering the definition of love there to sell this idea. You got to understand your enemy who's being manipulated, human agents being manipulated to think they're getting rid of you for love because they believe in this reincarnation. If they crack a few eggs, what's that? You just have to reincarnate into the perfect world that they'll make. So they're really not getting rid of you. They're not really doing anything wrong. They're justified in getting rid of you. <laughs> they're so loving and kind because they're doing it in the name of love. This is a mocking of God's final justice that will be poured out in the Revelation. God offers. He's slow to anger for a reason. He doesn't, he's not willing that any should perish. 
and um, but he knows who will, but he's still offering to them constantly, will turn back to me, I'll save you. Turn back to me, I'll save you. So God proves he's all about mercy, kindness, and goodness. And the devil always says, I'm going to control both pillars. I'm going to create a synthesis of love, 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 love. But it's really not. And so, so when God tries, you know, issue forth punishment, uh, he always does so when uh, the time of without remedy is reached. And that time without remedy is seen in, uh, the final time without remedy is seen in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, you'll constantly see God saying, will you repent? Will you repent? And they repent it not, they repent it not. It goes on and on and says that. God's merciful. He always is offering repentance. Come back to him, get restored, get, you know, get, get right with him. You, you know, you don't want to live under the devil's all-seeing eye of do as thou will, because that's total, utter deception. And that's uh, what that's all about. So, therefore, you don't be fooled. Their definitions of love, as she channeled, this kind of love is enforced by force with a kinder, gentle version of fascism and communism, all rolled into one in order to reach a paralytic state of synthesis that leads to a pure, pure uh, uh, spiritual state, a superman state. The definitions of love and goodwill, charity, truth, community, service, do not mean what we think they mean. Cults always change the meaning of words. Um, they, communist, communism and fascism and social d democracies alter language. So does the Ephesian six crowd. I can take you and show you that. That's the part of the plan. I don't have time to. To arrive there, they use deception and dishonesty to justify canceling millions of their God-given rights as human beings. It involves cracking a few eggs to achieve paradise. It involves the destruction of all that is decent and good. It involves, the, in the name of love, the decreasing, the reducing the world's global population by 90%. There's nothing loving, kind, or tolerant about these things at all. So let's look at this here in this slide. Like I said, you must tell them above all else that God is love, the hierarchy is love, that Christ is love. So their idea of love is that we have, we love you so much that if you don't agree with the struggle against the material world which we created, it, fascism, and you are labeled as bad fascist, bad Stalinist, if you believe in the Bible, or you believe in liberty and freedom and love of nation and country. You're a materialist, okay? And you have to be eradicated. You're a reactionary force because we're the good guys. We're all about love. So let's look at this slide. An externalization of the hierarchy. The return of the Christ. There are two groups who can do much. Those already using the financial resources of the world, if they will catch the new vision, also see the handwriting on the wall, which is bringing the old order down in destruction. And secondly, the mass of good, kindly people in all classes and fears of influence. Did you hear that? This system involves bringing the old order down in destruction and the mass of good, kindly people in all classes and fears of influence. How could that be love? How could that be tolerant? How could that, doesn't that prove that they're not about love at all? Their definition of love is skewed. It ain't what you're talking about. No tolerance at all. None. Zero. Zilch. None at all. Now, Alice Bailey, Externalization of the Hierarchy, page 6162. I just want to read this to you so you can see it. I quote, today we are watching the death of a civilization or cycle of incarnation of humanity in all fields of human expression. Crystallization, deterioration of, had set in. Worn out religious dogmas and the grip of theology and orthodox churches have no longer sufficed to hold allegiance of the potent inner spiritual life. Humanity is deeply spiritual and innately religious but needs today a new form which to clothe the ancient varieties. Old political schools have been deemed inadequate. New ideologies bear witness to the strength of the life which is seeking a more adequate expression. The educational systems, having served their purpose, are fast being recognized as inadequate to meet the need of, of the demanding life of the race. There is everywhere the cry for change and for those new forms of religious, political, educational, economic life of the race, the human race, which will allow a, a freer and better spiritual expression. Such a change is rapidly coming and is regarded by some as death. 
terrible and, and to be avoided if possible, it is, it is indeed death, but it is beneficial and needed. This is beneficial and needed to get rid of the, this stuff. And if you dare raise your voice against it, we're going to cancel you because we are justified. We're, we're doing this in the name of love because we're all about a, a sustainability, a new world where everybody gets along and we enforce right human relationships. Uh, relationships. You have to be collectivist. It's all for the collective good. Page 62. We bear in mind also that the forces of destruction or death are twofold. First, the rapidly emerging and developing life with its deemed for more room for expansion and fuller experience. It is the spiritual aspiration for change and progress. And secondly, the reactionary forces and the conservative attitudes which adhere to the well-known and the familiar and which hate the new and untried in the unknown. So right there, they have the plan and to label you as the enemy of, of all that is new and good. We can have a kinder, gentler communism that Alice Bailey wanted to impose upon the world, that she wrote about, that, that, that they want to work through. A new form of, to of fascism, blended together with communism to make a new world, a new spirit man, eventually. Because they're doing it in the name of love. So, they just have to get rid of you. Look at this next slide. Page 62. Such dying is ever a painful process. Pain has always been a purifying agent employed by the lords of destiny to bring about liberation. The accumulated pain of the present war and the inherent pain of the earlier stage began in 1914 is bringing about salutary and changing world consciousness. The lord of pain has descended from his throne and treading the ways of earth today, bringing distress, agony, and terror on those who cannot interpret his ends, and bringing about this, the re-stimulation of the instincts of self-preservation in its higher aspect, so is the instinct to immortality, it tends to focus on humanity's attention upon the life aspect and not the form. In other words, forget the materialism, go to pure spirit. We're doing this for love, so you'd be a loving spiritual being, a pure spirit. Woohoo! worshiping the all-seeing eye because it's all about liberty and freedom and, and, and love, 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 love. It's just changing words and to get there, we have to do <laughs> what, how, what, how do you get there? Oh my. And then it says the names of the lords of karma. Karma, synthesis, dark lodge, white lodge, playing against each other. Karmetic justice to bring about a parallelic destruction of all and disillusioning of all, bringing into a pure spiritual state of nirvana. The symbolic and from the angle of their inner meaning, relationship, enlightenment, pain, and return, ponder this. They are all peculiarly active at this time, and in their activity lies the hope of humanity. The hope of humanity, wow, to reach this state. So all this is done under the disguise of achieving love, community, right human relationships, inclusive, inclusiveness, equity, sustainability. The hierarchy defines love as fraternal love, communal love. The needs of the many outweighs the needs of the few. That's the motto of this type of love. It is achieved by self-rejection, rejection of yourself. Oh, I have to be taxed and give all my money to the state to redistribute it for equity's sake. That proves I'm loving and kind. I reach a higher spiritual state. Um, it is not the type of biblical love that cherishes. That means agape love means to cherish, nurture, age, and helps others rise out of poverty and despair by allowing folks to generate wealth according to their own ability to freely use to help others in their time of need. They view that type of thing as old-fashioned, not adequate. Well, they are the ones hindering it and stopping it through taxation. They are the ones hindering it, creating the problem so, you know, people can't really do this mode of it. They've been invaded the church and made the, and created uh, the synthesis in the church to avoid doing this as well, okay? I'm time to teach on God's financial plan and, and all that. I'm just not, not going to go there right now. This way, if you're able to work, earn your bread, you can help others out of poverty and the funds never run out to do so. So you can help a lot of people, but if you give it all to the state, the state will, can't produce anything. The oligarchy is going to use you. They're more than happy to give you universal income and exploit you more. Everybody equally poor, equally impoverished, a serf for, to wipe their feet on by the state. So they make you feel guilty. 
You have to be self-loathing. Hate the color of your skin. You are an enemy. You are a materialist. You are a fascist. Well, you're not. Not at all. That's their idea of love. The Western worldview is deemed as the enemy because it teaches folks how to fish so they can provide for themselves and teach others how to fish. And not to be a leech on society is, 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 is the anathema, the enemy. Okay? Socialism makes a leech state possible. How? By stealing from others to spread the wealth around so all become equally impoverished and easily controlled by the state. Food is scarce. People become despondent. They become lazy. The roads be suddenly become filled with potholes. And interstate highways are almost unrideable. And, you know, things like that begin to happen. Bridges start to deteriorate, okay, when you see this. Crime is in the streets. You see long lines. You can't find goods and services as you once did. You're reduced to a state of non-beings, useful to the whims of the state and enforced by the great merchants of the earth. That is the Babylonian system. That is the system of the great eye of the universal mind. To spread your wealth around, not theirs, that's how they define charity. We, the, the philanthropist of the world, will spread the wealth around because we know how to run things better than you do because you're failing your duty. Well, you made it virtually impossible, almost impossible for us to give anymore. You see the dy dynamics there? How, you know, through the health and wealth gospel and prosperity gospel, so forth, etc. Do you see how this is working even in the church to make the church look like the enemy? So, so their idea is the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. That's their idea of love. To justify your surrender of your self-autonomy for their greater good of the few at the top of the food chain. This is a revised form of feudalism. It's the divine right of kings and nobles of ancient times, model of government. They shame you in order to confiscate your earnings for their common good. The great merchants of the earth teach you what right human rela relations look like. They must look like targets. They must look like blood lights. They must look like Disney's. Hey, we're coming for your children. We, have, we don't want you to have borders, but we want a border over there, protect it in Ukraine, but no border here. Think about it. Just serfdom, no free speech, no right to defend yourself, no equal justice under the law, only corruptions and crony capitalism to educate and rule everybody on how a good global citizen should live. This is their brand of a kinder, gentler version of communism and fascism they desire to impose by for force on all disguised as achieving what Alice Bailey channeled as group love group consciousness, Christ consciousness, group control, harmony, and right human relationships. Any who hold a Judaic Christian Western worldview about generating wealth to help others and teach them that they can too, they can lift themselves out of poverty, is deemed material, selfishly evil, doesn't work. It's only concerned with one's little world, your greedy dogs, your selfish, your unenlightened, your bigots, who cause all the world's poverty and racism because you're hoarding all the wealth. How do you combat this? The answer is revealed in Ephesians chapter 6, verses uh, 12 through 18, called the armor of God. So what I'm going to do here real quickly, I'm, I suggest you add what I'm about to reveal to you and share to you about together with everything you learned about the armor of God. David Guzik's Enduring Word Commentary on Ephesians 6.10 is a call to stand against evil. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Finally, this comes at the end of the letter, and the letter Paul, that Paul has carefully established our place in Jesus, and then the basics of the Christian walk. This is the last section he's dealing with in that walk. And so he, he writes these things down here. I'm not going to read them for you. I'm going to put them in my own words. So what he's doing here, that word finally in there, in the Greek tense here, is this. Everything in this letter of the book of Ephesians is how to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Okay, so let me briefly review what chapters 1 through 6 of Ephesians is so you can understand what Paul is revealing here to an assembly of believers that's suffering unmitigated persecution. 
of the type we will probably be experiencing soon. So chapter one, I'm just going through real briefly, real quickly here, so you can understand this. It tells us that we have a sealed inheritance in heaven waiting for us. That is sealed and confirmed by the Holy Spirit. That through the Holy Spirit, God gives us wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, of who he is. Revealing the hope of our calling, he empowers us by the same Spirit that raised from the Jesus from the dead. That we have a right to use his name in combat against the spiritual forces so we can stand against all the wilds and schemes and mind games of the devil. That's what chapter 1 talks about. So how to be strong in the Lord? you got to know these things. You realize them. That's why Paul prayed that you, you, you'll come into a fuller knowledge of God in that chapter. Chapter 2, here's a summary of chapter 2. It's not everything, but chapter 2 says, We realize what we once were before we were saved. That's how we're strong in the Lord. And how he freed us from what we were been a slave to is how to be strong in the Lord. And if you you got to know what Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9 says, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, that we are saved by grace through faith and not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we, are, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before, beforehand that we should walk in them, that we are now part of the covenant of the people of God. We're no longer strangers and for, foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. That we are the temple of God. And since we are the temple of God, the light of God shines in us so we can reflect the fruit of the Spirit out to other people. That's what that means. Chapter 3 talks about that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, or the faithfulness of knowing the faithfulness of God, that you being rooted and grounded in love, real love, not the world's love, Comprehend what is the width, the length, the depth, and the height, and know the love of Christ which passes all knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That's how to be strong in the Lord. This is not the, the, the world's idea of love. It's not Alice Bailey's side of, of love. This is the love of agape love that cherishes, nurtures, edifies, builds up, rebukes, reproves, chastens, defends to the death, fights against evil, and makes a stand. without our conditions getting in the way of it. Just think about it. Okay? Chapter 4 is about learning to walk in humility before the Lord God with reverence uh, uh, to who, about who we are to represent. We're going to be humble before the Lord. we got to know that we represent Christ, that he's given folks to help train and equip us in knowing him and sound doctrine. That we should no longer be lived out our old ways or be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. We're to speak the truth to one another. We're to stop giving place to the devil. We're to work out our own, with our, we are to work with our own hands. If you're not disabled, that's what he's talking about. You've got to put away bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, malice, evil speaking, and, and instead learn how to be kind to one another, tenderhearted, and how to forgive one another. Even as God in Christ forgave you, that's the essence of chapter 4. That's how to be strong in the Lord. Chapter 5 and 6 here. It says, walk in love toward each other. That's what it's about. Have no fellowship with darkness, but rather expose darkness for what it is and does. That the devil destroys the family. So in here he starts to teach you to teach husbands and wives and children what they are to be like toward each other. Restore the family system. Okay? Honor your parents and your elders. How to act with employers. And employers are not supposed to be harsh and mean, slave masters toward you, toward their employees. The armor of God assists us in these endeavors. It is the capstone on how to overcome suffering and persecution and the trials of this life. So, Ephesians chapter 6. Why are we to, to study the, the Word of God and, and, and look at this letter and know what the letter says? That's how we strong in the Lord and the power of His might. This is how we put on the whole armor of God by knowing what He wrote in the prior verses, in the prior chapter, that you, you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Why? Because you will know for a fact that the wiles of the devil will make you doubt your salvation. The wiles of the devil say you have to maintain works to stay saved. That's not true. God saves you to the uttermost. A true believer. There's true believers and there's false believers. You know, 
So I'm talking about true believers. They are going to go through a sanctification process. They're going to learn how they don't love as good as they should. They're going to learn about themselves and say, Lord, I can't change. Help me. And he begins a process of healing your heart, your broken heart, wherever you're injured, wherever you're at. He'll, you know, get you through stuff. And that's how it starts. Now, Paul's talking about all that in these first, uh, uh, in these first five chapters of the book of Ephesians. So you don't stray in the away. Okay, let's look at this again. Put on the whole armor. That's how you put on the whole armor. You know who you are in Christ, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, that he gave you the ability to use his name. You have authority as a believer against the forces of darkness, and you are required to expose darkness. You are required to battle against it, even at the point of death. You're to make a stand against it, because love will do that. Love doesn't cower and hide and say, well, we got to be like the world, look like the world to avoid trouble. <laughs> Let's go woke. No, a loving pastor would not do that. It would teach you how to make a stand. Think about it. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Because we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. The people that are under control by the left-wing people of the society are controlled by principalities, powers, and demonic hosts, okay? Alice Bailey wrote about a period of time of overshadowing people and, uh, and a time of mass possession coming in at the end of the fifth root race era stage of humanity into the sixth root race stage to, and, and uh, so to mass possess and overshadow people. Overshadowing is a form of possession where a person maintains their, their, um, their mental stability. They're not lunatics and they reason they're highly intelligent, but, a, but it's like the flip is switched on, a switch is flipped on and they act one way. Then they go to their family and the flip is switched to act another way. So nobody can really tell they're really possessed. They come across as highly intelligent people with the best noble in these. They talk about love and new age and all this stuff. And, you know, they're, they're, they're overshadowed. These are the forces that are behind it. That's who we wrestle against. There will come a time when spiritual war gets hot and it's getting hot where you require to expose this darkness in people and expose the principalities and powers and rulers of darkness in heavenly places. Even at the point of laying down your own life in order to stop it. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand with in the evil day and having done all to stand. That is a powerful statement and it's very powerful. And so we're to stand against it. We're not to cave. We're to expose evil. Stand how? Well, let's look at the next slide. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Having done all to stand, stand therefore. You know, stand is mentioned four times in this, this, cha in, in this chapter 6, verses 12 through 18 here. He's making, if you love and walking in the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, whatever, you're required to make a stand. How? Gird it yourself with the waist, your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Having girded your waist with truth. What does that mean? Truth is, like Dr. Tony Evans would say, is the standard by which reality is measured by. I can look at myself in the shower and I know what I am as a human being. And you of the opposite gender can look and take you take your shower. You can tell what you are. Truth is the objective standard by which reality is measured by. And, um, and if you want sustainability, you want to alter what it means to be human and, and, and hoodwink parents and kids. And you want to go after them when they're young to make a transition so they can never procreate because sustainability is all about decreasing the world's population in a benevolent way. Because these people think it's loving and kind to eliminate 90% of the world's population by benevolent means that you're witnessing right now and you don't know why. 
we're called to expose this for only waste of truth. I know who I am in Christ Jesus. I know what Ephesians chapter 1 through 5 and first part of chapter 6 tells. It defines what the family is, defines how father and mother and children are to interact with each other and grandparents and so forth, etc. It teaches you how to, how, to, how to get back on track. It gives you the template to follow. It tells you that this world's not my home, and I am to walk by the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, so forth, etc., righteousness, holiness, uh, and I have problems. I have God's working on me. I'm being sanctified. I have the truth about all that. I'm the truth that I have a power and authority to rebuke the forces of darkness. I have the power and authority to make a stand against the nut jobs out there at the point of me being beat up or put to death, which will prove that they are not loving or kind. God will hold it to account, and I can die, like Stephen said. You know, I see the Lord high and lifted up, and I can offer forgiveness to the ones putting me to death. That's greater love than them trying to say, you're going to bow down to your knee to this way or it's the highway. Whose love is superior? I just disproved you. Do you understand what truth does? Think about it. Having your waist gird with truth, put on the breastplate of righteousness. I like how um, Vine's Expository Dictionary, the older version of the dictionary, I don't know if the newer versions have, have edited this out, but righteousness used to be spelled in Old English of the, of the Old King James as right wiseness, doing what is right under the wisdom of God. Okay. <laughs> yeah, living a righteous life, doing what you think is right under God's sight. He's guiding you to live right, reflect Him. So that protects you, protects your heart. The truth undergirds you in knowing who you are, knowing what it says in the book of Ephesians about righteousness, to be a reflection, reflect him. Be imitators of God, dear children, and walk in love. The love that cherishes, nurtures, edifies, even chastens, even will defend the fatherless and the weak. It will defend your right to free speech. It will defend you. It will lay down its life for you. Think about it. Think real hard. Verse 15, having your feet shod with the preparation. Preparation means foundation, a firm footing of the gospel of peace. The word peace means wholeness, soundness. It's what the gospel produces in our lives. It's bore out by growth that makes one complete, whole, sound. In other words, you bear good fruit. So this is not just talking about the gospel. It's the whole gospel. The gospel of, of Jesus Christ, who he is. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and salvation message, and righteousness in Christ, and all that. It goes through the process of sanctification. The Holy Spirit is now lives in you to sanctify you. Yes, you got problems. He'll make you whole. He'll heal your broken heart. He'll be working your life to set you free. He'll give you good news. This is a process. This is the whole thing. Your feet was shod with basically combat boots. In other words, because life is... You're in a combat situation in life, and the gospel will, will produce in you wholeness and soundness of heart and mind. All what you go through in life, in your journey of life, it'll make you whole and sound, and you'll begin to produce good fruit wherever you go. That's what that means. Having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Wherever you go in life, you have your combat boots on because you know you are in a war that wants you to destroy all that is decent and good and alter it into another form. And you are to remain to, true to the form that God has designed for us. And it is not an evil, malevolent thing. It is a good thing. Mothers and fathers who love each other and children raised in the fear and admonition of the Lord is a good thing. And grandparents and uh, everybody getting whole and sound in mind and, 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 and all this stuff. That's a good thing. It's not evil. Working for your own bread so you can create and generate wealth so you can help other people when the time comes if you're able to. But with high inflation and all this stuff that's robbing you, how can you when you have this system that wants to destroy you by labeling you as a fascist, a bigot? And you're the enemy. You need those combat boots on to get through the muck, don't you think? Let's continue. Above all, taking the shield of faith. This is faith in God's faithfulness of who and what he's like. 
So by that, you can quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. This is why I keep telling people, when you see the, the word faith in it, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, put a parenthetical behind faith, say, without faith, faith in God's faithfulness, that he's trustworthy, who he is, who he is, who he is, who he is, what he's like, what his nature and character is. Have faith in God's faithfulness is the substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. By faith, we attain promises because we, know, we view God as the faithful God. That is our shield of faith that we lift up, that quench all the fiery darts. God is faithful. He'll get me through. He's the faithful God. In the book of Ephesians chapter 1 through 5 there, it talks about the faithfulness of God. He saved you. Remember where you came from. You didn't deserve salvation, but he loved you so much he didn't want to leave you in your fallen state. He knocked on your door until you finally got it and you got saved. Now he's going to see you through the rest of the way. He's a faithful God. He's going to save you to the uttermost. You're having crisis of faith in your life. Everyone does. Some more severe than others. But he'll get you through it. I don't know, I know how, but I know that he's able. I know whom I believe and that he, and, I, and I'm fully persuaded that he's able to, to take what he's done in my life and complete it until that day. He's the faithful God. By knowing that God is faithful, that's my shield. That's why Paul said in, in Ephesians chapter 1, I pray that you may know him. You come into a fuller knowledge of him. That's what Paul is saying. See how this connects. You're able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Take up the helmet of salvation. What's the helmet of salvation? Um, I know that I'm saved by grace through faith, not of works. But I'm also created for good works. Okay? That's what it's talking about. You know, you, you, uh, you know that... Um, then you learn how God, he's faithful to save you to the uttermost. And you are sealed, as it says in Ephesians chapter 1. And that works are not how you are kept saved, but rather revealed by how we live out our lives. You know, it's about being transformed by the renewing and the washing of the water of the word of God. It's knowing who you are in Christ, that he's a faithful God who delivers and saves us and gets us through. Our good works are about learning how to reflect his love, joy, stuff like that. And also includes how we fail in those endeavors and how he restores us and gets us back on tra track when we go, whoops, I blew it. It's revealed in, in John chapter, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we say we have no sin, the truth is not in us. If we, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. He's faithful and just. He's faithful and just to cleanse us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Uh, I, I live my life by that because I know he's faithful to forgive me. I blow it just like everybody else. But I'm learning to not do so, so much. I'm learning to sin less than I did the day before. I'm not the same person as I used to be. I now have a track record of works, not to prove that I'm saved or I'm saved or, or, or earn my salvation, but that his, he's working on me. I'm saved for we're created as his poimonia, as Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, his masterpiece. He's working on us to do his works within us. I'm, look, I'm living my life knowing that God will work through us and through me. And take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Uh, this is self evident. This is the Word of God, his promises. You have promises that you can claim on yourself, and there's nothing wrong with that. But, but you got to know that you you can't twist the scriptures and try to try to manipulate God's character traits and so forth and get what you want in a selfish way. It ain't going to work. That's not what it's talking about at all. This is a sword of the spirit taking the word of God against the enemies that are coming at you, who are saying that you are a bigot, you are you are against this, you're against that, you you, you are a materialist, you you are a you are, uh, you are a fascist, you, you are this, you are that, you know. This is taking the word of God to be able to defend yourself and make a stand against the world, the flesh, and the devil. This is the sword of the spirit. You know, the sword of the spirit. You know what the word of God does? It cuts the heart. It's the discerner of the thoughts and tents of the heart. God will give you the words to speak when the enemies confront you. That will cut their heart. When Stephen spoke 
to the, to those people who wanted to kill him, they were cut in the heart, and they they rejected that, and God exposed that they weren't loving, kind, tolerant. They were a violation of the word. They of the word of God. They were committing murder unjustly, using God's word to justify it. Okay, that's the idea of the sword of the spirit. Cut the heart to the heart of the matter. Don't mince words. Get to it. Get to the point. <laughs> okay. And it's in connection with the next verse 18. Praying always always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to the sin with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So the, using the Word of God with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Just like Paul gave examples twice in the book of Ephesians about praying and how to pray in this way. I'm not going to repeat them. You can go in there. You, that's your homework assignment. Look at those two prayers in the book of Ephesians because it sums up what I'm talking about here. I'm praying with all prayer and supplication with all the saints all the time. You know, I'll pray that they can make a stand. Pray that their eyes will be opened up. Pray that they can see doctrines of demon. Pray that these things. I'm using the word of God as the sword of the spirit to combat that in, a, in spiritual warfare. Okay, that is, these two things connect with all prayer and supplication for the saints. Basically, what I'm just going to sum up what I'm trying to say here. Putting on the armor of God helps us make a stand like Daniel and his friends did when confronted with a Babylonian system. Daniel was thrown into lions, then his friends were cast into a fiery furnace. And Daniel was, uh, you know, was set up by the, 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 the hierarchy of his of the, of the human hierarchy that was in charge of Nebuchadnezzar and, the, and Darius to go after him. Now we, we have to make a stand like the ancient judges of Israel were raised up to do against ongoing evil when spiritual warfare goes hot. We're approaching the point when spiritual warfare is getting hot. It's no time to play church games. We can't ignore what's going on around us. We cannot go back to the old ways we once did church and hope it all goes away if we just compromise or we just go back to teaching the old things we talked about, prosperity and, and pop psychology. You have to, comes a time when the remnant has to stand up and make a stand. And by having the armor of God, understanding what Ephesians chapters 1 through 6 is talking about is how to put on the armor of God. So all I can do is just ask and pray that the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, that he re illuminate you in his light, not the devil's light, okay? That God will illuminate you with his light of life so that you can grow in the Lord and how you grow, you're able to share that to others. That he can heal your broken heart, that he will mend, mend your crushed spirit, that he will get you free from whatever's holding you captive, that he'll set you from out of your prison bound, that he'll heal your body, he'll heal your mind, he'll bring healing to your heart. That's all I can ask and pray for you right now, all of you. That the Lord will do that. I'm supplicating to the Lord because he's a faithful God and I know that he came to do those things. I ask him to do that on your behalf right now in Jesus' name. With that, if you'd like to contact me and everything, you can just look on the screen and see my contact information, how to get a hold of me by email. If you want to support what I do, all the information is there and all that. With that, you guys be blessed in Jesus' name.